decision to make first. Uh, because last week I kind of said that you know we're going to finish Philippians this week. Uh, we're going to go through like verses, like chapter four, verse four to nine, and it's going to be done. And I was preparing the message, and it's like, oh my gosh, it's not going to be done. Like there's just so much packed into it, and I just like I have to split it into two weeks. So we're going to have like. Philippians for like extension. So we're, we're definitely going to finish next week because there's only two verses left next week. And if I can't do that, I should get off sabbatical earlier. Um, but so, so I lied. Um, we're not finishing this week. We'll finish it uh, next week. Uh, but I'd like us to turn our Bible uh, to Philippians chapter 4, uh, verses 4 to 7. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. And uh, Nate's Bible is not working because his Bible is far. Uh, so if you have something to share with him, you can as well. Um, otherwise, it's also on the screen. The reason I want you guys to follow on the phone is Philippians is just so, so precious. And you probably want to highlight something. You probably want to write down something. But here it goes. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Is, is this verse anyone's favorite verse, like one of the favorite verses out there? I feel see if you're nodding heads, yeah, if you're waving arms, it's great. Um, on, on Monday, um, on Monday, I actually had uh, quite a scare at home uh, with Aaliyah. Uh, so Aaliyah is being her usual self, uh, so she was active, she was climbing up and down, and she's also clumsy. So I, I, was, I walked away from her for a brief moment because I had to make her milk before she goes to nap. And then I heard this thud. And, uh, and then, then comes like this large wail, and I was like, oh, this is no fake cry, she, she is in pain. So I went over and I picked her up, I tried to soothe her, and, uh, and she was just crying with her mouth wide open. And I said, like, it's okay, it's okay. And then I start seeing some blood, like pull, pulling up in her mouth. I was like, this is not okay. And I rushed to the bathroom, uh, and during the way, because it was like coming out, and she actually spat it out, it was all over the place, I was like, Panicking. I noticed there was like this little cut on her uh, chin and she was bleeding. It seemed like she fell and she knocked her chin onto some corner of the furniture. And because she's always so loud and her tongue's probably out fucking somewhere, and she bit her tongue as well. And, uh, and it, was, it was painful. Um, and, and the impact of the, of the fall left a physical mark on her, a physical wound. And a, a physical wound is also known as a trauma, which actually comes from a Greek word in the 17th century to mean wound, a physical wound. But we know trauma, uh, the word trauma these days uh, means so much more. Uh, it carries the meaning of um, an experience that is deeply distressing or disturbing. Uh, what you heard is just Aaliyah being active out there, hopefully not coming. You know, just the experience that is deeply disturbing or distressing. You know, it could be for some, divorce in the family. Some, maybe you grew up being bullied at school. Or you failed at something you were striving so hard for and you didn't meet it. Uh, maybe a death of a close one in the family. Emotional type of trauma can also happen. You see, the thing with physical trauma, maybe to the leg, is it leaves you with, with, with a limp. Right? It leaves you with a lip to remind you that you are injured, uh, to, to tell us that it needs time to heal, and it also presents this new norm that tells us that, hey, life is different now, and you have to live with this until you are healed. But then emotional and, and, and mental trauma is, is very different. They're, they're hidden from plain sight. Others don't realize that you are coping with something, and, and sometimes we ourselves don't even realize we are injured and needing time to heal, heal because we, we don't walk with a limp per se. See, trauma is different to everyone, but it is an impact. It's an injury that when it's not properly treated, it leads to further injuries. 
Uh, I don't know anyone rolled their ankle before, but but when you roll your ankle, you you have a look that what they call it, you favor uh, your injury, you try to uh, take pressure off it. What you do with it as you live is your energy stretch to other parts of your body to compensate for your injury, and you're giving it workloads that it's not used to in the past. So when you are injured, you are more prone to further injury. If you don't put safety measures around it uh, to, to rest or you don't give time to heal, you have further injuries as well. And that is also true with emotional and mental trauma. And this is why mental ill health can be so, so complex. It just cascades one over the other. And it seems like you know what it is, but there might be something else going on. Why am I saying this? You see, when, when I read about Paul's life, our, our Apostle Paul, you know, the first impression of Paul that we all have is, man, how does he do it? He's like this super Apostle. He accomplishes everything. He goes through so much. And he's crazy. Like, how does he do it? How is he so strong and has so much strength and all that? But, but when you look at Paul's life, when you read the, the, the stories of Paul's life in the Bible, what I see is traumatic events. I, I wonder whether you ever thought about the traumatic events Paul went through in his life. I mean, when we study Philippians, and as we study Philippians, we know he is actually currently imprisoned, right? In fact, before he was officially in prison, he had been waiting for a trial that took actually a few years until he arrived at Rome. So he had been in confinement of some sort for quite some years already. In his letter to the Corinthians, he mentioned that he lived with this physical discomfort and pain that he calls it a thorn in his flesh. And he, if you read the story, he had seen his co-workers being threatened, being injured, or even killed. In fact, Paul goes on to list out all the obvious traumatic events in his life. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he goes on, I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received the Jews, the, uh, from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold. Imagine even just experiencing just one of these in our lives. Just one of these in our lives. How much would that trauma change the outlook of our lives? You know, as, as I look at Paul's life, I, I, I can't help but wonder. You know, just as a human being, I can't help but wonder. And you know, it's not like biblically found or anything. You won't read that in the Bible. But I think it's fair. To say perhaps, perhaps the superhuman Paul understands the challenges and struggles of mental ill health. I mean, is it too far fetched to say someone who had lived through traumatic events can understand the challenges and struggles of mental ill health? And I think that's why when we read Paul's letters, when we read his instruction, when we read some of the things that he said, don't read it as this superhuman in an unachievable place that will never be at where he is and live out this kind of life. Can we read what Paul is writing in his letter as someone who's been through brokenness, as someone who comes face to face, who lives with brokenness in his life as well? I wonder if we're okay to just sit with that assumption that Paul understands what it means to go through traumatic events and struggle with mental ill health at some point in his life. 
And if you're okay with this assumption today, I'd like to say that perhaps what we just read is Paul's summary of how he learned to receive peace in all situations in the midst of his traumatic experiences. That Paul is speaking from experience that this is tried and tested. This works. If you're lacking peace, if peace is something that has been brought from you, this is how you receive peace. So most of us have this verse, have these passages as, as our favorite verses in the Bible. But do we read it as a comfort? Just kind of like soothing, like a, like a, like, oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's a comfort that it'll be fine. Or are we reading it as an instruction that Paul is saying, do this. And the peace that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Because I've lived through all these events in my life and I can still proclaim that Christ is enough, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me, that I've learned the secret that is to be content and I know who is God and how to receive peace from Him. And the three things Paul has instructed in this, in this passage is to rejoice. Alright, there's something you do. Rejoice. Do not worry. There's something you can do. Do not worry. And then to pray. To pray. And I believe these three are fundamental to our mental and spiritual, not just well-being, but resiliency <laughs> as well. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to commit ourselves to you and we just want to acknowledge that as the author of our lives, you know what is good for us. You know how to, how to, you know how to bring us to a place of peace that is in you. You know us, Lord. I thank you that Paul isn't someone that comes from a, a type of life and living that we cannot relate that he's not speaking out of theories or ideas that, that is unrelatable. We thank you, Lord, that Paul understands that he's gone through far worse, yet this is what he proclaims and instructs. So, Lord, I pray that these words would just sit with us differently today, that these words would instruct us differently today. And, Lord, we're all crying out for peace. Lord, I pray that the peace of God will be with us and that as we learn we can then go on and encourage other people around us and say, hey, this works. This works. I've been through it and it works. So Lord, I just pray that you speak to us powerfully tonight. And pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Rejoice. He says this something similar in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It is very simple, it's very direct, and it says, Rejoice always, because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Jesus. If you ever wonder, God, what is your will? What is the purpose? What do you want me to do? Well, here's one. Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. See, one of the, one of the most prominent studies in the advancement of psychology and the field of science in that area, one of the most prominent studies is the positive impact of joyful and happy mood. Right? Well, how does that have an impact onto someone's well-being, both physical and mental as well. The fact is, when you're in that state of joy and happiness, it changes something physical. It actually changes your breathing. It changes your circulatory system. That means the, all the system that transfers blood and oxygen and the whole breathing thing. It changes your blood and blood flow. It, it, it relaxes you. It decompresses you. And I'm no scientist, so I won't go on. But it promotes a lot of these scientific key stuff that is super beneficial for your well-being. If you want to learn more, just go on journals and papers and studies. You can find all these things. And when we read the Bible about what the, what the research has been saying right now, the Bible agrees. Actually, the Bible doesn't agree. Science agrees with what the Bible has always been saying for centuries 
before these studies come out. The Proverbs say, a cheerful heart is a good medicine. Right, Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Paul is saying right here, rejoice, and it leads to the peace of God being with you. So, so Paul says rejoice, and to rejoice, to rejoice is to do whatever that is that cultivates joy. Like being thankful, like practicing gratitude. In fact, if you, if, if you ever go to psychologists, psychiatrists, other psyche like something is, then counselors or whatever, if you go with something that you're struggling, more often than not, one of the things that they will say is, you need to practice gratitude. You need to practice gratitude because it helps manage and improve mental ill health. And Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And he says, I will say it again, rejoice. That's just how important it is. And the fact is, we, our rejoicing isn't just based on happy things and events in our life. Paul is saying our source and reason to enjoy, uh, to rejoice is not just because there's good things going on in our lives. He's actually saying, hey, no, actually, no, no matter the circumstances, Christ alone is enough of a reason to rejoice. You know what Christ had already done for you, who he is for you, who you are and how God sees you, all that alone is enough. But if there's anything else you want to add on to it, feel free to. But Paul is saying rejoice in the Lord always because all is enough in Christ alone. And then he goes on to say the second thing. Do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious. Do not worry about anything. In Matthew chapter 6, um, I'm going to read this to you. It's quite a long passage. Um, it says, Therefore I tell you, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is, life, is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than that? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about cars? See how the flowers of the field grow, they do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So this is on the topic of worry, and it is taught by Jesus himself that he started by, I tell you, that's how he says, hey, listen up, this is important. And um, if you have your Bible, you should go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, and just highlight this, bookmark this. It's one of the things you want handy with you to remind you of the important things. So, this is not just a passive do not worry, alright? There, there are truths that uh, Jesus is revealing in here as to the reason why we do not need to worry. And the first thing that Jesus points out, a crucial thing, something that we tend to forget when we're spiraling in our thoughts and worry. And the first thing is this, you are valuable. You are valuable. I mean, Jesus is saying, if God can meet the needs of the sparrow, He can meet your needs. You are much more valuable. You are valuable. Sometimes we forget we are valuable to God. And uh, in fact, you know, why don't you just remind someone next to you, just tell them, hey, you're valuable. <laughs> Some of you have to say, you're very smiling face. But I turn to the other side and say, you are precious. <laughs> 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 but 
first, thing, first thing that God wants to remind us about not worrying is you are valuable. And then the second truth kind of hurts. He just points out blatantly that you have no control of life. Right? You have no control of life. Whatever it is that troubles you, that troubles your heart, that worries you, in comparison to life itself, is actually very, very insignificant, isn't it? Yet you can't even control life itself. Why waste your energy worrying on the other things, the lesser things in life, when you can't deal with the most important thing anyway? Second truth, you are not in control of life itself. And after a tough build to swallow, Jesus God like, hey, uh, just don't forget, God cares immensely about you. Your life is in His hands. So find another person to just say, God cares about you. God cares about you. And in this truth, uh, is for us to hold closely to combat worry, is that you are not so often, this is how we feel. The moment we go through something, we're thinking through it, we're thinking, no one understands. I can't share because no one cares. I'm on my own on this. But you are not alone. You know, Jesus mentioned about, you know, for the pagans. And he said, because you're not pagan. So, so what is pagan? Pagan is this very archaic religious word that none of us really use these days. But it is to describe people who worship you know, many gods and goddesses or referring to people who don't uh, worship any god or not religious. So in context of the Jewish context when it's used, it's referring to people who don't worship the biblical god, the god himself. So Jesus said, hey, you're not pagan. You worship God. Not just that you worship but you have him. You, you know him. He knows you. And he is with you. In Philippians 4, it talks about the Lord is near. You know, last week we talked about Christ in me. And the promises all over Old Testament is that God will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. Over and over again through history and through uh, right now in our lives, God is keep on saying, you are not alone. In fact, you are never alone. You are never on your own. Despite how you feel about it, the truth is you are not alone. You are not alone. And then the fourth thing he wants to remind us. Again, these are truth as in these, these are just what is. You can't change it. Whatever you might believe otherwise, God is very clear. This is what's going on. And then the next thing is God knows what you need. You may know what you want, what you desire in your heart, but God knows what you need. Right? There's a difference in that. The, the things that worries you, the things that keeps you up, the, the thoughts that rob you of the peace, how many of these thoughts are to give you, you know, like a better quality of life that you want? But then how many of these thoughts are to give you an abundant life that God is determined that you need in your life? You know, God knows what you need. No, I'm sorry, I misread. You know, your heavenly Father, not just a distant God, your heavenly Father knows your needs. And, and your Father's desire for you will be far more beneficial for your well-being than what you desire for yourself. So it's so easy that we get stuck, sucked in, we run around, we do things to secure our future. Right? We do things to prevent harm in our life in the future. We do things to have more, to have better, and allow all these things to actually then to worry us in the present. And with that, we, we miss another important truth that Jesus wants to point out, that is, we don't even know what will happen tomorrow. We actually don't know what will happen tomorrow. Anything can happen. That's not in our control. Bill King famously said yesterday, is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift of God, which is why we call it the present. You know, God's present for you is for you to be present in the present. 
That's God's will for you. And he's just pointing out that stop worrying all that and be present. I mean, how often does this not change, is it? Okay, this is what kind of works. I mean, how often are you living in what is happening right now? You know, how often are you aware of right now that annoying heat pump that is just buzzing and the people and around you are sitting to cars? How, how often are you living in what's happening right now? You know, being aware of the people around you, being aware of God's work around you, being involved in the life that is happening right now. So often we allow our past to hold us captive, right? And then we become anxious over our past. And then we give ourselves to the fear of tomorrow and we start worrying about it before it even arrives. Yesterday is a history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is the gift of God, which is why we call it the present. So stop worrying about everything because you have no control of what is the most important already. That is life itself. And yet you don't worry about that. So don't worry over the lesser things that you don't need to worry. I mean, all of us here, the, the fact that we're, we came driving and we're warm and we feel fit, our basic needs are already met. So don't be consumed by your wants and desires and allow it to worry you. And remember, the one in control of life itself He's willing to provide for you, and he also cares about you, and he values you, and sees you as valuable. So that's all the reason that we can be just present with what God is doing. You know, yesterday is history, and God will make right of your past. We believe that when we speak it in Romans chapter 8. And we know that all things work together for the good for those who love God, who have been called according to his purpose, right? Yesterday is history, and God will make right your past. And though tomorrow is a mystery, we actually know who holds tomorrow. It's in God's hand, and He is for you. He will fight for you, so just stay calm. We have security and hope in Him already, and that is our future. So do not be anxious about anything. And instead of worrying, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. All right, so from, from, from Paul's own traumatic experiences, shifting on the plural of it, in life, his instruction is to receive, to receive peace in all circumstances, is to rejoice always, to not be anxious about anything, to pray in every situation. All right? Paul is using absolute terms here. Uh, you can have peace always if you rejoice always, you don't be anxious about anything, and that in every situation you pray. So when it comes to praying, first of all, who we are praying to is very important. You have to know that this dialogue of prayer, this communication, is going to God. It's going to God. I mean, when, when you're down, you, just, you, don't, you, don't just, you don't just bring it. You know, to your girlfriends, to your mates, you know, to a tub of ice cream or, you know, go to some brain-numbing TV series and just letting it play. You don't just share it online, write up a rant blog or something. All of these things could be helpful outlets, but on its own, it's never the solution. In fact, even those things as a first step, it often causes more trouble than help, isn't it? Instead of worry, pray. Who are praying to? We're praying to God. Why do we pray to God? Because He is your Heavenly Father. He cares about you. He wants the best for you. He, 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 he provides practically for you. And He is in control of that future. The mystery of your life is in His hand. He has power to work all things for the good. You know, the, the good, the bad, the neutral, the worst, all of that. He can work for your good. So this is why we pray first to God. Or we go to a friend who can quickly point you to God first and then go from there. And the form of prayer is important to note is because it is you present your requests. And sometimes, you know, we think that as mature Christians, 
You know, we don't just ask, you know, we don't always come with requests. And, and I think sometimes in our Christian life, our, our prayers change. We think that it's not mature to present requests. It's okay to ask God for something, okay? Some of you need to hear this, that it's okay to ask God for something. It's okay to have requests. Because this is what children do to their parents. I'm 34 now, and I ask my mom and dad for stuff all the time. There's no shame in that because I know who they are. I know how much they love me, and I know as their son, that's my right of passage. I can actually do that with them. And that's what children do with parents. We don't need to earn favors. We can just present requests. And God is our Heavenly Father. See, Paul even used the word petition. He used the word petition to kind of just double down on the nature of it. Petition is when you, you know, get people together, you must lie, but it is to present a request. You know, this is what we think should happen. You know, let's do this. So he's double downing on the nature of prayer that is, it's a request, requesting from God. Presenting requests is not a selfish thing. Presenting requests is natural and is common, especially in relationships you trust, right? Think about this. Your family, your closest friends, the ones that you love around you, or the people that you deeply trust in. They are the ones you are more comfortable to bring requests to, to admit your weaknesses and to ask them for their help. You present requests to the ones that you trust and are closest to you. So how we present requests, who we present to, give us a picture of our relationship to the person as well. So presenting requests is not bad. Demanding an outcome is, all right? Feeling entitled that your request must be met the way you want it, that's the no good part of it. So this is why Paul reminds us that this request in prayer is offered with thanksgiving. We're here to ask, but we're not here to demand. We're not here to say, I know what is best, and God, you need to do it that way because I know better than you. We're not demanding, but we're asking. We ask for something with gratitude. And when we, when we do that, it actually does reveal the quality of relationship that you have with the person. And to ask God with gratitude in everything shows how you understand your relationship with God to be. That He is a Father, that you are close with Him, that you trust Him, you know that He loves you, he, you know He wants to provide for you, you know that He wants to give you the best that He has for you, that is good for you. Alright? If you can ask Him about anything and everything, it just shows what you have with Him. That you trust that He will give the best for you right now in this situation that you are in as well. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God. The peace of God is otherworldly. You know, it's, it's, it's not what you can explain with your understanding. It just transcends our actual understanding. Right? What it means is, it's different to what you think it is. Right? When we think peace can be gained when we have more wealth. But the thing is, this peace of God is accessible by the poor people as well. Right? When we think peace is living in a fortress, in a gated community, having security guards, doormen, doormen, and all that, and we feel secure, and then we will have peace. But people who live in war have access to this peace of God as well. You see, we think peace is having popularity with people, always with people, always look like we're having a good time and people are always surrounding us, surrounding us. But at the same time, you know, introverts with the smaller circle of friends, they also have access to this peace of God. The peace of God is simply different to the peace that we try to imitate with our human effort. We find the closest thing to it and we think, you know, being comfortable means I'm at peace. Feeling happy means I'm at peace. Feeling relaxed and at ease is, is the literal definition of being at peace. And that's what we think about peace. But it, it transcends our understanding. It transcends all understanding. It is 
otherworldly. It is heavenly, and it is from God. This peace is not the same of what we once think peace is. Jesus said, "Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. It's completely different. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid." See, this is a different peace, and it also doesn't just sit with you. It actually guards you. It actually guards you. It's not just something that you know you put on your wound and it soothes you, and that's it. It actually heals you. And beyond that, it then provides a protective film for you, for your heart, hearts here, and for your mind. You know, for your feeling and your thinking, and it's so important to be guarded. You know, because because feeling, feel, when you feel something, it hits instantly, doesn't it? It starts getting you all when it hits instantly. But when you think about it, when you dwell on it, that's when it hits your it's your mind. You know, when you dwell on it continuously, it then goes on to affect your heart again, and to reshape your thinking again. And the cycle continues and never ends. But the peace of God is here to guard. All that your heart and your mind, and it's different to what the world is providing. It's different to what the world is telling you that you need. It's different to just being comfortable, happy, and at ease. But it's the peace of God that transcends all understanding, and that is what God wants for you. In fact, that's the will of God in Thessalonians when it says, you know, "Rejoice, you know, give thanks, you know, pray." That is exactly what it's saying here, because this is the will of God for you. To have the peace of God to guard your heart and your mind, the peace of God that transcends all understanding with you, that is the will of Christ for you. And what this looks like ultimately is that you will trust God completely. That He is the source of your rejoicing. That He is the reason you do not need to worry, and He is the one that you pray to and trust all things to as well. <coughs> And I feel like I just feel like this is something we need to capture, and we need to hear it from Apostle Paul, who is not just the Almighty Paul that does all things. It is the Paul that has gone through traumatic events in his life, and when he's able to say this, you know there's something to it. When he can go through that dozens, a list of traumatic events, sometimes some things happen more than once, and he can say that, hey, there's peace. I'm living with these peace. This peace can be with you. It means something. And if you're sitting here just like I don't understand how this is possible, great, because it transcends all understanding. It's not something that we understand and then we grasp. It's something that we do, we obey obediently, faithfully, and you will have, and you will experience, and then you will have tasted and seen and be saying, this is true. And you just want to share it to everyone around you and say, "This is true. That this is real." You know, for me, I've I've shared it before as well, and I I keep sharing it again because it's it's I I because I, I couldn't explain that experience that I had. And that is、um, from 2015 to 2017.、Um, there's just so much happening、uh, in my personal life. You know that space, that thing I guard from everyone, that keeps everyone at arm's length.、Um, it, it is that、um, there's a lot of things happening in our family, and to the point that my mom and dad are both、um, diagnosed by the GP to be severely depressed. You know, and I was just going through so much with life. And for some of us here,、um, you know、uh, who, who, who Becky was, and to go through what happened in her life, that was tough. And it all compressed together, and I was just, I was just really losing it. And I remember over those years,、um, I had to, because how Mum was struggling and how she was a- attempting,、um, it was very difficult. And I don't want to say this for pity's sake. I, I don't want to say this to to trigger anything. And I hope it's not. But I just want to describe it a little bit because of how God's peace was working in that place. 
No, I, I, can't, I can't shape that image. It will be forever part of my life that hopefully God will still redeem it for the good somehow. But I remember there was one incident that I literally had to carry my mom with my dad into our car so that we can drive her back to our place because she was completely knocked out by <coughs> trying to overdose or something. And then to have her in our house for the next few days, just living in fear and not knowing what will happen. And then to have her to tell us in our face that that's it, she wants to end it. And to disappear from our sight, for us to call the police, for the ambulance to come, and then to find her and to take her to the hospital, to sit with her where she was just so certain that I have decided there's nothing that will change my mind. I'm going to have to try and finish my life. And to sit with all that, I did not know what to do. I've never felt so hopeless, I've never felt so helpless, you know, like, there's nothing I could do. And, and I remember just praying. I prayed the shortest prayer I ever prayed. And I just said, oh, God, just help me. Oh, God, just help me. And you would think, you would think, these moments like this, you can never fall asleep because so much was going on. But I made that prayer, I just, God, just, God, help me. I remember praying that prayer and I remember nothing else because I immediately fall asleep after that prayer. I just had, and I woke up and I just, I couldn't even believe I actually fell asleep after what just happened. But there was a peace I just, I just can't understand. I literally, I, I, I can't understand. It just, it just fell on me. I fell asleep and then that was it. And the next day, somehow God just miraculously turns things around. And, 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 and I can stand here and say that they, my mom had, had, hasn't been, like, she, she's, she's feeling so great right now. Like, her life, she just finds so much meaning again. She's so happy. She's so much joy. None of our joy. It is all God. And I, I, I can't explain it. But that's just it, isn't it? That's the peace of God that transcends all understanding. Not because of what you have done, not because of what you will do, not because of your, your, your clever planning and strategizing, going to this course, that course, seeking out the best counselors out there. Those are good. Don't get me wrong, those are good. But Paul going through all that he went through, he said, hey, if you keep doing these things, it will not just help you, but it will start to guard you from further injuries in that way. To rejoice always. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's just bow our head. And let's just bring this time to God. You know, we started today and say, you have battles that you're holding on, that you are struggling on your own. But the Lord fights through battles for you. He fights for you. I just feel like sitting here, many of you, you are you're crying out for that supernatural, otherworldly peace. Not just in your life, but for, for the people I just want you to bring that request to God. Present that request to God. Like writing up a petition, be extremely clear about what you are asking. Present it to God. Who you're asking for, why you're asking. Just, just cry out to Him. If you're at the place that you have no words for, it, do what I did. God, help me.
it's just trickle down and just just wrap around their heart, wrap around their their mind, like, like a protective film on their feelings and their thinking. But you just guard them as they cry out to you, as they present it to you. So good because like I just, I just feel like so many of us just pressing in and just crying out to them. And Lord, I pray that that that, that <laughs> as you cry out, it's because we trust you, Lord. And may you be trustworthy as they trust in you. Lord, I pray that you just give them peace, leave it with them, so that they can go to different places like the disciples being sent out, and what they will say is peace. Leave the peace of God with them. You know, that's what Jesus was commanding his disciples that they can go around places, they will knock on doors, and they will see if the peace of God will rest in this place. Because the peace of God for you is the will of God for you. And that you impart the peace of God in all places all around you is the will of God through you. So, Lord, I just pray that you guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus with the peace of God that transcends all understanding. Lord, we need you. So may God help us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just, I just, I just feel like what you have, you got, how you guys have been crying and presenting your request. It's just this beautiful offering that is being received by God that he is pleased and he just wants to now just pour out to you because now you know the simple key to access the peace of God in your life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will, not maybe, not might, but will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Whenever I say, If you want to talk to someone after the service, uh, feel free to just be able to do that. If you have a prayer for someone, feel free to just minister to others in that as well. Um, God is working, and there's the peace of God that the whole world is just desperate to find, and we have this. But we need to know how to access it, how to make it a part of us. And next week, next week, we get to look into what works so that the God of peace, right? Not just the peace of God, but the God of peace may be with us. And then we'll talk about it next week in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 to 9. So I'll see you guys next week. And uh, just like to wrap up. Bless you, final blessing, yes. Thank you. And uh, actually, as I, <laughs> as I pray for the final blessing, can I have Bill to come up? Uh, Bill is leaving us, and Bill is going up to Wellington. He found work up there. And we have nothing to do with this. But uh, why don't we just stand and let us pray for Bill and also receive the final blessing. Heavenly Father, we just want to pray for Bill. We just want to pray for this brother that, Lord, although he hasn't come, he hasn't been back with us for long, but God, you had your purpose and you're sending him away. And Lord, I just pray that as he goes to Wellington, that he can see why he is there. That, Lord, whatever it is that you are to do to build him up, to add value to him, and to see him mature in you, Lord, I pray that you give Bill the eyes to see and the heart to receive so that he can be more and more like you in all that he does right there in Wellington as well. Lord, bless this trip up. Bless his time there. Lord, I pray that you'll bless him with great people to surround him, a great, great church that will build him up in a church that he can build into as well. So Lord, we just thank you for all this, with your blessing, blessing rest upon him. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship power of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us. 
from now on and forevermore. Amen.